I think at times we find ourselves like Saul in Acts chapter 9. Saul knew what the church was preaching. That's why he was persecuting them. But I also believe that the words that they were speaking and ministering on were convicting him and convicting his lifestyle to the point where when that light shined and he, and, and, and he fell to the ground and the Lord called out, he said, Saul, Saul. When he called him, Saul said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Saul was living a life contrary to the word of God. And I believe that that word was knocking on his heart and knocking on his door day after day, but he was trying to silence and suppress the word. We can't come to church and sit in preaching and teaching time after time and try to push and suppress that down and try to live our lifestyle, but try to see the purpose and will of God established and fulfilled. We can't live on both sides. And we're all going to reach a place. Like, 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 like Saul did it that day where we're, we're going to make a choice. Am I going to walk with God or am I going to walk contrary to him? I did a Bible study, been doing a Bible study with, with the young man, and I, I told him, I said, I, I believe something's going to happen in this world. And over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about just where this world has gone. And I said, I believe something's going to happen in this world where it's going to be so detrimental where people are going to make a choice whether they're walking with Jesus or they're not. I'm not talking about showing up in a church service. I'm talking about where they're really connected and they have a relationship with God or they don't. And that line is going to be very clear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 1, it says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, and this is Paul speaking, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man of Christ, uh, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one was caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I, can, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see, when I learn to walk with Jesus every day, I find that his grace, his strength, and all that he has is enough, and it's all that I need. And I believe that each and every one of us are going to have things that we pray that, that God takes away from out of, our, out of our lives. I believe that we're all going to have things that we say, God, would you remove this? But there are things that God allows us to come walk right up next to us that are going to help keep us on the path of life. There is a book. It's called Hind's Feet on High Places. And starting out, that book isn't very much fun. It doesn't really get fun until probably about three-quarters of the way through it. But the, the, the main um, character, individual of that book is called Much Afraid. And the good shepherd talked to her about a place she could go. He talked about that, that place and, and, and getting Heinz feet. She was crippled, couldn't walk well. But he assigned her two companions. I believe it was sorrow and suffering. Now here we go back onto the dying part now. We talk about living. 
But he, he gave two companions for her to walk along the path. And when she took a hold of their hands, she felt the, the, the suffering, she felt pain. But they were the very things that kept her on the path. The time would come when they would depart from her and leave her. But in order to keep her on the path, there were things that had to, those things had to be present in her life for her to go where God, well, where the good shepherd wanted her to go. In my life, there are going to be things that the Lord allows to accompany me, accompany me along the path of life. Those things being there does not mean that God's hand and favor are not on my life. Just because God has deprived me of some things does not mean that his hand is not on my life. Just because I'm going through trouble does not mean he's not there. That could just be necessary for me to be saved in that day and in that moment. And I believe Paul, he, he talked about the revelations and things that he have. And, you know, we want to get up and preach uh, all the great stuff. We want to preach about prison doors being open and chains being broken and walking through a Red Sea and, and all these great things. And, and that's awesome. But those things come at a cost. And, they, and there's a price to pay for those. Those things aren't free. You, you get people in the pulpit, and that, that's all that, that they see of a preacher, of a pastor, an evangelist. But the, you don't know what they go through at home and outside of that to walk with God and to stay saved. But I must have those things present in my life so that his grace can be all that I need. So Paul said, I glory in my infirmities. Now, I don't, I, for me, if that's me talking, I'm not shouting when something goes goes right or goes wrong. I'm not dancing. I, I, I think it was, it was a year or so, a couple, a few years ago, actually, I went to church one Sunday night. I had a bad attitude about something, and I sat up in that service with a nasty attitude because I was mad, and I let everybody know about it. I'm not glorying in this right now. But Paul, he wasn't saying, I, I, I'm, I'm glorying, I'm shouting, I'm running laps around the church because I'm in so much pain. I'm glorying in this because I know that through this, God is going to do something greater than what I can imagine. You see, I believe that we all must have an eye to see beyond what we're going through, what we're facing, what's, what's, what's against us. That's truly living in Jesus Christ. When, 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 when I can look beyond that adversity, Jesus, he, he, he had to see beyond the cross. He had to see more than just that cross. He had to see more than just that suffering. And if he could see that, then we could also see that. We could also feel that if we're walking with him. Isaiah chapter 40 at, 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 at the end of that chapter, it talks about the, 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 the youth grow weary, the youth faint, the youth get tired. But the scripture that we know is it says, they that wait on the Lord, those that get connected with the Lord, those that get wrapped in him and, and, and don't depart, don't get disconnected, they shall renew strength. There will be days where, where we get tired, where we get faint, where our minds get weary. There will be days when we pick up cares that we should not pick up and walk with them. There will be days when, when, when we do get burdened down. But the Lord offers us an opportunity to cast all that away and to get reconnected with him. That's living right there. Living isn't going and trying to, and figuring out all my problems and getting my solution down pat and pat myself on the back and making all the money I can get. That's not living. Living is keeping him at the forefront of everything that's going on. And so this is where this really gets good. Jeremiah chapter 17. Thank you, media ministry for helping me with those lights there. I didn't want this to make it look like this was an emotional session. But Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and the salt land, and not inhabit it. Blessed is the man 
that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be like, be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. He said, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm. Cursed is that man that leans on another man, and whose heart, you're not just leaning on somebody, you're not just trusting in somebody, but whose heart departeth from the Lord, leaves the Lord, for he shall be like the heat in the desert. Now, I know some of y'all probably wish this was a desert in here tonight. But when you're in a desert and dry place, he says that you shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places. Can I put it this way? In, in the desert, you don't have peace when you're not connected with him. Because the only thing you can see is I'm suffering. I'm going through. I'm facing this. This isn't happening for me. I can't get this. I can't catch a break. It seems like everything is against me. But blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters and whose roots spread out. And if you have a tree whose roots are spreading out, that means that that tree is growing. That means that that tree is producing fruit. And that means that that tree, that the more the storms that come against that tree, the stronger that that, that tree is going to stand. Because his roots aren't just in this narrow area where the trunk is. But those roots are spread out all across the land so that no matter what comes against that tree, I'm going to stand. And in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Not, in, not listening to what everybody's saying, not blown around by every wind of doctrine, Verse 2 says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He takes pleasure in the law of the Lord, in the word of the Lord. That word delight means delight, pleasure, desire, longing. His desires for the word of the Lord. Jesus told the parable about a man who obeys his commandments. He shall be planted on a firm foundation. When the winds and storms of life come, I'm not moving anywhere. But when you're not obeying his commands and listening to his words, just like that structure that's built upon the sand, and that first wind that blows knocks you over. The psalm says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. It's not a morning a.m., 6 to 7, get my prayer time meditation. This isn't I'm fasting at lunch meditation. Day and night. So how do you meditate day and night? That word meditate means to moan, growl, utter, muse, mutter, meditate, devise, plot, speak. Meditate isn't just, you know, just sitting here and... But that word, that meditation is fellowshipping with the Lord. It's fellowshipping with his word. And then when I'm outside of those focused times, when I'm riding in the car and when I'm at work and when I'm doing other things, the word of the Lord is just kind of rolling around in there. My thoughts are always towards him. When I open up my mouth and speak, I begin to speak life. When I pray, I'm not just praying for myself, but I'm confessing things and, and prophesying and speaking life out into the atmosphere. And it says that that happens day and night. Well, then that means I don't have a life to live. I can't do the things that I want and say the things that I want. No, you're missing it. You see, when my delight is towards him, and, 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 and I'm so connected with him 24 hours a day, seven days a week, I don't miss the old lifestyle. I don't miss those old things, but it says his, his delight, his desire, his longing. I can't wait to get up and spend time with him. What happens to that fire when we first get saved? We just can't, we, 
We can't wait to get to church. We can't wait to get connected with the body of Christ and can't wait to pray and read his word. But in his law, he meditates day and night. And verse 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And I realize that I have a season in which I'm going to be fruitful. And I'm not caught up in how everybody else is living. I'm not caught up in comparing myself. Well, they've got their, they're bearing this fruit and I'm not bearing fruit. No, they're bearing fruit in their season. My season is going to come where I'm going to bear fruit. And they're going to bear fruit. I'm going to rejoice with them when they, when, when they bear fruit and they're going to rejoice with me. But I, I've got to understand my season and my time. But I've got to be connected. Verse 4 says, the ungodly are not so. They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Those that are tossed to and fro trying to find Jesus and they think they settle down for a moment and they're moving on to something else. They're not rooted. They're not solid. They're not firm. But when I'm connected with him and I've got that living water flowing through my roots, I'm not moving. I'm staying right where I'm at. I'm staying in my relationship with Jesus Christ. It's going to grow stronger. I'm going to bear fruit regardless of what anybody else does or says or thinks. But I'm going to be fruitful. And that's the, that's the result of walking with him. That's the result of living and fellowshipping with him. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 says, quench not the spirit. Quench means to extinguish. Quench. A fire or things on fire. To be quenched. To go out. Of divine influence. To quench. To suppress or stifle. Don't stifle the spirit. Don't suppress the spirit. When the Spirit moves on you, when the Spirit speaks to you, I, and I, I, I know I've had those times when the Lord speaks to me and get that nudge, I probably should go write this down somewhere. And he nudges and says, go write it down. I'm like, Lord, but you know what? I'm in the middle of something here. Or he wakes you up and says, come on, let's, let's go pray. And I say, hey, Lord, just five more minutes. And that snooze button turned into another 50 minutes, and it's time to get up. But don't quench the spirit. Don't stifle. Don't suppress. But let that spirit, the spirit of God, have life and let it be manifested through each and every one of us how God sees fit. You see, the closer that I get to God, I don't have to worry about trying not to quench the spirit. But it just becomes second nature. When he speaks, I do. When he speaks, I speak. When he speaks, I go. I don't have to focus on trying to do something or not do something when I'm connected with him. Because that's just like if, if I'm so connected with him and if he takes a step, I take a step. He takes a step to the side, I mirror the same thing. But when I lose that flow and that connection and he takes a step and I'm still standing there, I'm not in step, I'm not in sync with him. I enjoy watching soldiers march. I think that's an awesome thing. It's a great view, and they, they march in step. But you can easily tell when one person gets out of step. When, when one person is not in line with all the others, you can easily tell that. They stick out like a sore thumb. But what happens if nobody in that army is in step? You think that's the norm. What happens if this body here is not in step with him? Then we just look around and say, oh, that's just normal. But if we all gather together and one person's out of step, we know that, hey, you need to get something right. Now, I'm not going to come here and call you out and pull you up and lay it all out in front of you to get it all right. But my desire is to be in step with him and to move with him and to move how he moves. Galatians chapter 5. This passage of Scripture talks about fruit of the Spirit. And I remember some time back I was in a setting and they, they, they were talking about fruit of the Spirit and, and they, they, they asked the, the question, what fruit do you want, I want to make sure I say it right, what, what fruit do you want to 
have produced in your garden, in your life? And they, they mentioned different things, and it basically was about them producing. You know, I, I want patience to be produced, and I want these things to be produced. But I can't produce any of that. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit produces the fruit. The Spirit produces the fruit because of my connection. So if I'm connected to Jesus, then the fruit's going to be produced. But if I'm disconnected from him, no fruit. So I don't have to work to produce love. I don't have to work to produce faith. I don't have to work to produce joy. I don't have to work to produce peace. That comes as, as a result of my connection with him. I, wanna, I want patience to, pre, to be produced in my life. I want to be able to endure. Well, first, if you get connected with him and live with him and walk with him, all of that is going to come from that connection, and he's going to bring things in my life to help produce those things. How do you learn to love somebody? Well, that person that rubs you the wrong way, Jesus said, and he, he talked about those, he said, basically that those who aren't with him, he, he, he talked about, I believe it was sinners, he said, they love other people that they don't even know and that don't love them. And if you do the same thing, what thank have you? What do you have to say about that? Sinners even do that. But the Lord will put me in positions to develop the right fruits in me. I want to have long suffering. Well, guess what? He's going to put you in a position to suffer long. But seriously, I want to have the peace of the Lord. Good. You just signed up for a storm. Here it comes. That's the only way that that's going to be developed. I've got the peace of the Lord, and I'm just on fire for Jesus. Okay, well, hold on. You haven't got it all yet. You got just a piece of it, but just hold on. But God has to take us places, and that's why dwelling in him, abiding in him, brings all of that about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, This I say unto you, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, revelings, such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do the, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To live in the Spirit means to live, breathe, be among the living, not lifeless, not dead. So first, I must, in order to live in the Spirit, I must be alive. I must be breathing in the Spirit. I must have that fellowship with Jesus Christ. I must be in relationship with Jesus Christ. But he says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit, I must be active. In, in Matthew chapter 4, 4, and I believe Luke 4, 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you want to have true life, take in the word of God. But don't just take it in. Let it come out of your very being. Let it be the thing that you talk about. Let it be the thing that you stand on. When adversity comes, what are you standing on? What am I standing on? Why am I still here? Because I have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I live in the Spirit, that means the flesh must be dead. That means that I've crucified the flesh. I've, I've gotten rid of the, the, the affections. I've gotten rid of the lusts and all of those things. You see, when I walk in the... When, 
in, in, in walking and fellowshipping with him. I believe it's Mark chapter 16. And it says, and, and, and after Jesus ascended to heaven, he said, the disciples went forth, and the Lord went with them, working with them everywhere that they went, performing signs and wonders and miracles. But the only way any of that could happen is if I fellowship with him and if I live in him. We, we, we know in, in Acts where they receive the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And that's great. That's just the start. That's just the living part. But what happens after that? And right after that, after all of that was noised abroad and about, what happened? Many came inquiring, what is going on here? And immediately Peter began to respond and preach and all of that, so much so that it brought about a result. You see, their connection with him automatically brings about a, a connection and fruitfulness outward. If my connection is with him and him alone, then that means I will never manifest the kingdom of God on the earth. The sons of God can never be manifested if first I don't have a connection with him. But because of my connection with him, it, it is necessary and it is mandated that I make a connection outward. My roots should grow outward. My, my, my branches should grow outward. I should not stay in the same place that I have been. You take on the, these courses that, 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 that we're bringing about starting in 2018. What's the purpose of that? So that we don't just stay in a place of stagnation, but that we become equipped and we can grow. Some of these courses are going to take us to a place where we realize, hey, I got to cut this out. I can't do this. This is contrary to the word of God. This isn't helping God. This isn't helping my fruitfulness in him. Because in order to walk with him, he's saying, you can't have this in your life. You can't have that in your life. These things must go. I want to keep these things. I want to build on these things so that we can all be fruitful. Now, I don't want to get to the end of time. And he looks in my basket and says, what have you got for me? I say, well, Lord, you gave me your spirit. And I went and I um, went to church, went to the prayer meeting on Friday night. From 11 p.m. to 5, and I stayed up, or 4, and I stayed up the whole time, and I prayed. And I did all the things that I was supposed to, but I, I held on to your word tight, God. I, I held on to your spirit. I, I guarded it. I, I kept it all. I protected it. And he's wanting to know, but who did you give it to? Who did you reach for? Whose life did you touch? Who did you minister to based on what I gave you? Freely ye have received, freely give. He didn't call us to be stingy. I'm stingy. I confess. I promise you, I'm stingy. Some of you have heard the story. When I was just a young child, I had a bag of Skittles, and my sister asked for one. And I think it dropped on the floor. I picked it up, and I gave it to her because she asked for a Skittle, and there it is. And I went on with my pack of Skittles. What's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. But the Lord didn't call me and design me to take his spirit, to hoard it, to cover it up, to go hide it somewhere, and just to give it back to him. He, he expects something back from what he's given me. And here's that, and I've heard this before. Well, I've been in the church 40, 50 years, and I've put my time in, so it's time for me to sit back and watch everybody else. The Lord doesn't have a 401K or retirement plan. And there are some people, some of the oldest people uh, I hear about that sitting in a restaurant, and, you know, those are the ones right there. They, they, they hear somebody talking, they just turn around and jump in that conversation and tell them the word of the Lord. It's, it's, it's us young people who've got a little bit of pride. Where, well, I don't want to be offensive or anything like that, but those older ones, well, they, they, they don't have time to waste. Look, you need to know this is what the Bible says. Can I pray for you? But God expects fruit from me. And it's not about me going, okay, we got to go knock on doors and do whatever and, and go hand out some flyers and, and tracks and get people to come to church. That is a strain if you're not connected with him. Teaching Bible studies is a strain if you're not connected with him. It is. We got to go knock on doors. Don't they know it's 30 degrees out here and they, they want me out here doing all this stuff and it's raining and all of that. And 
I'm just going to melt away. And yes, it's a strain. But when I'm so connected with him, I'm saying, Lord, lead me to the hungry and lead the hungry to me. Lord, is there somebody out here whose path you want me to bring to, to come across? If I've got to knock on 50 doors, God, and if it's that 50th door that I knock on, so be it. But I want to be so connected to you that I don't give up at that 49th door. I want to be so connected to you that you're saying, just go to one more door. Stay here. Dwell here. Stay with me. Stay connected with me so that you can bear much fruit. And only God knows what interaction that we will have and what will transpire and what will take place when we put ourselves in a position of giving ourselves first and foremost to him, to being connected, to being in a relationship with him so that he can bear fruit through us. But not just on a set time, but my life is wrapped around him. My life is fully invested in him, that God, whenever you speak, I'm listening. God, whatever you want to do, I'm game for it. I'm open. God, here are my hands. God, here are my feet. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. God, if you want to wake me up in the middle of the night, if you want to make wake me up three times in the night, if you want me to take a lunch break earlier than, than, than I would just to go talk to somebody, whatever. God, whatever it is, I want to be so connected with you that you can do whatever you want in my life. And yes, we could easily reach a place where the cares of this life the things of this world can come and choke out his spirit. And that's why Paul made the statement. He said, I die daily. The flesh fights against the spirit, and the spirit is fighting against the flesh. The question is, who's going to win tomorrow morning when I wake up? Who's going to win tomorrow morning when you wake up? Because God has a purpose for each and every one of us in, in every day. And I know that there are days that we may, may miss it. But, God, I don't want to miss your purpose for today. I don't want to miss your purpose for the next moment. God, if whatever I have to lay aside, I'm laying all that aside so that I can be fully connected with you. Can we pray here for a moment? Father, I pray that you would help us by your grace. Lord, as you said to Paul, that your grace was sufficient. I pray, Lord, that we would take your hand, that we would take hold of your grace. And, Lord, that we would find ourselves and find a place to walk with you, to be connected with you, so that we have that continual flow of living water inside of us. That's not just flowing in us, Lord, but flowing through us, that your life, that your purpose, that your word is alive in us and alive through us. And, Lord, that we can be all that you want us to be, so that we bear much fruit. And, Lord, it's not a tedious task. It's not a hard job of getting up and participating and walking with you. But, God, I pray that it would be our desire. I pray that it would be our passion to be connected with you, to love you, to walk with you. And as you desire to reach for the lost and the hungry, I pray, Lord, that that would become our heartbeat, Lord. And every day that we live and every moment that we would lose our desires in this world and get connected with yours, that we, we would lose our passions in this world and get connected with your passion and get connected with your heartbeat, that we would have your ears for the lost, Lord, that we would hear the sighing of the prisoner, that we would have eyes that see beyond our world and our adversity, and Lord, that we would see your harvest, that we would see that it's white, that's that it's ready to be harvested, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we can do nothing without you. We can't reap the harvest without you. We can't bear fruit without you, Lord. But I pray that by your grace, God, in every day and every moment, that we would present ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, as vessels, as conduits that you can work through, Lord, that you can flow through, that you can minister through, Lord, that you can have your way, that many souls will be saved alive, that many souls would be one, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I lose your grace upon this people here today. In the name of Jesus, I lose your strength upon them to be connected with you, Lord, that they all may mount up with wings as eagles, Lord, that they may soar to heights with you, Lord, that you can do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think according to your word, according to your work, according to your power, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, Shatarana Kiyasoto, 
Maria Satiea Corondo. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we make this all about you, not about ourselves, Lord, but we make it all about you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Praise God. Did you already tell him? Praise God. We're going to uh, take care of a couple of necessary things before uh, the second session here. Um, we do apologize for the uh, lack of sufficient heat um, for some. Some are fine. Um, by the time we're ready to go, it's going to be super warm. I guess after you get cold, you can't. Your body takes a while to get adjusted, but it's really warmer now. Some of you are like, I got cold an hour ago, so I'm still cold. <laughs> but uh, don't mean to make fun of your plight. Um, uh, but we are really trying to. <clears throat> adjust the settings with the thermostat. Uh, what we did, just for a quick explanation, I feel like I owe you explanation. Um, we had to set at a certain temperature uh, because it's getting colder uh, throughout the um, day. The last few days it was uh, really cold, freezing temperatures. Um, we had the temperature, the thermostat set for 52 here, um, as far as the sanctuary, and our heat for the sanctuary actually regulates all the air, the all the radiators throughout the whole building. And what that does, it drains the water in our boiler room. We have an old boiler room; it drains the water, um, and so the heat was on for a few days, and it drained all the water out. And uh, we thought we were fine. We had it set to come on. Um, at a certain time, which would have heated the building up properly uh, just in time for us to get here. We did get an alarm this morning to let us know, uh, and um, I just didn't, we didn't get here. I was in Annapolis at the time, and uh, letting us know that it was a little cooler. I had hoped that once I got here uh, um, that it would... Um, get warm enough in time. Typically it takes about an hour, but uh, I didn't consider the fact that it was 20 degrees colder than what it normally is, so it, it took a little, little, a little, it's taken a little longer. So, uh, but again, it was because of trying to make adjustments and we, we're going to uh, do better. So you don't have to have that in the back of your mind that, man, is it going to be cold? And, uh, so we are uh, trying to have a schedule where we can regulate it. We're actually going to try to get someone uh, to set something up where the water will flow automatically. It is an old system where the water will flow automatically. So, again, I do want to apologize. Hopefully, uh, uh, it's not too unbearable. If it is too unbearable for you, um, in all seriousness, if it's too unbearable for you, please... Uh, um, because everyone has different thresholds. Um, seriously, I think it is a little warmer downstairs. If you, you know, if you need to just go on down and, or just to, to exit the building, I won't get mad if you are too cold that you can't stay. All right. And all seriously, so I will, I, I will not. I will understand your body temperatures. Everyone's body temperature is different. Um, if it's too cold for you, so uh, we'll take up an offering if you need to jettison. We do have a second session. We're going to get here, get through. It has increased whether your, uh, your, your mind may be telling your body that it didn't. 
because the mind is really in control, not your body. Um, uh, your mind may be saying, it's still cold, um, but it's, it's getting warmer, so we do apologize. I did want to take five minutes to do that. Hopefully, we won't have to do that as, uh, too many more times, and we can have this thing um, right. It's, we're always trying to figure it out. Um, by the time we figure it all out, it's, it's uh, summertime. And then we have to figure out the heat all over, the air all over again, right? Uh, we do have a couple of things we would like for you to uh, take with you. Uh, just a couple, couple of announcements we need to make. Nothing new, but I, I'm asking you, well, we do have something new. Initially, we don't. Uh, please, when you come up to, to give an offering, and if you're not given an offering, if you would grab one of these um, Equip You flyers, it will have on the back of them some important information. Um, uh, did you explain everything, what they are? Okay, so I was, wasn't in here. And I know some of you had some questions as to what the classes are. Some of you have not signed up yet. If you are interested, um, please. I know some of you, I personally know some of you have not signed up, not saying it, not saying it this in a negative way, but some of you have, uh, you know, we different situations or whatever. We had the uh, snow this past Sunday, et cetera, and so you may not have been here. If you are, in, if you are intending to come on Thursday nights, please sign up for one of the classes. I do believe we have, is this the classes? Well, we had an intercessory prayer out. Uh, I'm sorry, we do? So we have one of the classes. I guess he already t have taken care of that. So, all right, I was giving an announcement. So, he, so here are the flyers for that, for the uh, Antioch U or the Equip U. Um, so we have that. We also, if you haven't signed up for one of the prayer teams, please come sign up for one of the prayer teams as well. Uh, we are... Um, we have a uh, sufficient amount of people for a prayer team. We may ask one or two to switch. Um, can I get that uh, little thing, uh, document up? Is it ready? Um, just f by way of clarification, while we're waiting for that, everybody say uh, the 28th. That's on a Thursday. December the 28th. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. Yeah. So December the 28th. I know you're going to look at that now. December the 28th has nothing to do with this. I said I was going to say this while I was waiting for that to come up. December the 28th is a Antioch business meeting. If you are a member of this church, in good standing, um, we are having a business meeting at Central. We won't be here. That's two weeks from today. I know this is kind of a last minute, but it kind of fell through the cracks. Uh, the AEC, in terms of the AEC, trying to get it on the schedule, and we realized we needed to get this in. You know, uh, the bylaws say we need to have one. Now, hopefully we have a quorum and enough uh, people uh, that we can have the business meeting. There's only one thing, that, one important thing that we need to take care of. Uh, the bishop will be speaking uh, that particular night. And uh, so we won't be in this building. We didn't have anything set in this building anyway. We had a, a service, but we didn't have anything to cover. Uh, we was going to go through some logistics of uh, next year. So I'm asking you if you are a member. Now let me explain what that is. If you've been attending this church for at least 90 days and you have been faithful with the uh, attendance and faithful in your finances, meaning you do pay tithes. I don't know if you are aware. I'll give a, a just kind of throw this out because it's the Bible. But God has given us instructions on how we can be blessed. Paying tithes is not an option. 
Hello. It's in the word of God. It's not the law. Tithes was before the law. You can find tithes in Genesis. Before Exodus. Before the law was given. Okay. So. You're faithful with tithes. What you, how much you pay and all that. That's between you and God. If you're keeping something on the side. Not telling anyone. That's between you and God. But God says. Will a man rob God? They said. How will you rob me? He said. In tithes and offerings. Tithes is 10%. It's a tenth. So, now, if you're not faithful in your tithes, you can start being faithful tonight. Amen. You say, well, hold up. I, I, I'll get paid to next week. Well, next week then. So, uh, again, 90 days. Now, if you are a transferee from another church, we do have a few people who have come in, and they are transferees from another church. Uh, we want to, please, uh, please see me at the service if you feel like you want this to be a part of your church. We want to make it official, uh, and it's very simple to make it official, and so uh, we want to do that. And so you will have the right to vote uh, in our business meeting. If you are not a, uh, an official member at this time, I would say please come so you can see what that is all about. So when it's time for you to become an official member, which you could be in the next 90 days, we can take care of that as well. Okay, the 28th. Everybody say the 28th. All right. Uh, that's when the business meeting will take place. Uh, we just took care of that today. Now, up here, can you... So we're going to talk about the prayer slots. The prayer slots is 30 minutes, right? We don't, let me, we have a prayer chain that we're getting, getting ready to do. The prayer chain is not a 24-hour prayer chain, all right? Now, if you pray for 24 hours, God bless you. Our prayer chain, again, will be morning, Afternoon and evening prayer, or what the Bible call oblation. All right? And so the morning hours are from 6 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. What that means is that not that you will pray from 6 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. It means you're going to pray for 30 minutes straight if you sign up for morning prayer one day. So, for instance... If you sign up for, say, for instance, can, I, can you get the whole document, please? I think that's just part of the document. Up some. If you do the minimize button, you'll be able to hit that little minimize. No, that's maximize. That little yeah, decrease button, yeah, hit that. There we go. All right, that's good enough. So, no, oh, you had it. That's good enough. All right, so... The week, especially for you leaders, the week of, week one, two, three, four, you put on there. This is for the leaders. They will give this to those who are signing up on their teams. The week of, the month, uh, the team, which team it is, the leader's name, these are the time slots. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We Keep in mind, on Sunday, that team will come in 30 minutes early on Sunday morning at respective locations and Sunday evening here for 30 minutes prior to service to pray. So s Sundays are covered. So if you sign up, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm taking the time to do this. For team number one, there may be 15 people. Team number two, there may be 15 people that's a part of that team. For instance, we only need uh, eight. We only need nine people per team to make this work. Now, let me show you what we're doing. There are six days, right? And there are three time slots per day. Three times six is 18. So we only need 18 prayer slots filled for a particular week. Every person, we're asking to choose two time slots. 
correct? If we have nine people choosing two time slots, that equals to 18 time slots. And every team has at least nine people. So this will work. Now, what this will mean is if you have 15 people, there may be t some time slots that will have two people, and that's fine. Okay, and so you'll sign up for your time slot for that particular week, week one of that particular month. The following month for week one, you'll sign up two time slots. Now, again, morning hours, just 30 minutes within that morning hour because you may be able to do 30 minutes before you go on and get started to go to work. You do the afternoon from 12 to 5.30. Uh, and likewise, in, uh, the evening, from 6 p.m. to 5 to 11:30 p.m. So every time frame has five and a half hours for you to get that done. So you have plenty of leeway, and it it, it, it eliminates a lot of excuses, right? And so your accountability, your prayer partner from your team, will check. See when you have prayer, that's the accountability's partner responsibility to see when their part when their partner has prayer. All right, and that's going to be the responsibility of the uh, the uh, team leaders to make sure that's carried out, carried out, and Sister Diggs who's going to help oversee that. So, uh, any questions? I want you to understand it. I think it's straightforward and simple, but I may have missed something. Are there any questions related? Because we're not going to be able to spend a whole lot of time on that. You'll have the sign-up sheets. You'll, you know, you'll be able to sign up. You're seeing your leader. You'll be able to sign up for your time slots. We're going to kick this out. We'll start this actually the week before we actually start. All right, we're starting the first of the year, so we'll, we'll be uh, having this out, especially for Team 1, actually for all the teams, so we can have that out of the way. So since there are no questions, with that, why don't you stand? And we're going to receive an offering. Amen. Uh, not, oh, not yet. We're going. To, we're, we're getting ready to receive an offering. You can stand. Uh, close. We're close. We're close. On Sunday morning. We're really close. On Sunday morning, uh, we'll have these available. Uh, these are uh, the Celebrate Life flyers. These are not for you. These are for you to invite, grab two or three. No more than that, please. We didn't get a lot of them. I'll have some more. Um, and invite some people um, out to the um, Sunday service. Uh, Elder Brown, why don't we do it this way? Elder Brown, he has some for East Baltimore in the morning. If you know you're not going to be here Sunday morning, or you know that you have a couple of people that you would like to invite, all right, this is for those who attend North Baltimore in the morning. You can grab some now. Just grab a couple, and I'll, I'll have some more out. Uh, but we need to get the word out because we uh, the, the service is at uh, 12 o'clock noon, not at 10 a.m., Inevitably, someone is going to show up at 10 a.m. We're going to put the sign out uh, as far as the time frame. We need to get that out tomorrow so everyone will know what time our service is on, on uh, Christmas Eve. It's 12 o'clock, no evening service. If we can get the word out, Sister Nicole, I know I saw you. Could you, could you set up uh, an email? Can you know how to do mass email in Fellowship One to anybody that's that has an uh, attribute with Antioch North or East Baltimore, North Baltimore, and uh, mask email of our church service. You take care of that. That way we don't, no one, you know, will slip through the cracks. All right. Won't you come and give? Take the necessary flyers. Sign up where you need to sign up. Brother Valley.
Church is not over yet. Um, can we come back together? Please. The Bible says what thou do, do quickly. <laughs> Um, could all the prayer leaders see Pastor Simpson after service? All right. Praise God. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Um, I want to speak on prayer. I'm not um, a professional on prayer. I'm learning just like you. Okay. So we're all in the same boat. And you know something? I think this prayer chain, chain going to help a lot of us, myself included. Because it's one thing to pray on your own and another thing to join with somebody else and pray. You know, it makes all the difference in the world. So, if you could join up, please. Um, verse 16 said, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The Greeks use the word without ceasing for a person with a hack and call for a repeated military attack. This is not continuous prayer, but prayer that reoccur regularly. It's not a continue like you've got to continually talk to the Lord, but it's something that you, you make up your mind. Say, for instance, um, you're going to pray for, 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 for someone in your, in your household. Um, while, while you're praying for that person to be, to be saved, you're not praying for that person and then jump into something else and pray for this and then jumping back to you're continually praying for that person. That's what praying without ceasing is. It's not just, you know, it's not just a prayer that you you you, you constantly gotta talk to the Lord on a continual basis. I'm just talking to God continually. No, you you set your mind on something specifically and you begin to pray for that on a regular basis. Okay. Um the prayer, this is, is not, um, the idea of persistence in prayer. The word pray is in the, the present tense and carried an idea of customary prayer. This person should have prayed throughout the day. Principle dynamic, prayer, pray at, at the state of non-stated time. Application, when, when thankful, when you are thankful, you pray. When you're in trouble, you pray. Pray when it's lacking in wisdom, you pray. Pray at, at, at a stated time. You set a time that you're going to pray. But then you got to pray when you don't have a time set. Okay? Because all your prayer cannot be, well, I, I, I pray because I'm going to set a prayer and I'm going to pray this time every, every day. What happens if you don't pray that day? That, that certain time. Will you not pray for the day because I didn't pray my time? It's something that you're going to pray because you, that's why the Bible says pray instant and in season and now. Um, because you're going you're gonna to come across someone on the job, they may need prayer. And if you didn't pray that day, will you not pray for that person because you didn't pray that day? You didn't put up your time before God? No, it's a prayer with all season, so that means any time, you know, you, you're just talking to the Lord on a regular basis. It's like, prayer is like, almost like breathing. You know, breathing, you don't have to think about breathing. You don't have to force yourself to breathe. It just happens. You just, you know, you know if you don't breathe, you're going to die. And prayer is the same way. If you don't pray, you're going to die. Because many of us have not prayed and we end up dying. Because you could be in the church and sit on a seat and still be dead. Because you didn't spend time in prayer with God. 
what will happen if you if you is a person that you, you you love a person a husband love a wife a wife love a husband but they did not talk they did not spend time together will you think that person still love you it's the same way with prayer. Every time I don't talk to God, I'm not showing him that I love him because I'm not even spending time with him. I'm not even talking to him. Prayer is, is, is a relationship. And in a, in a relationship, you don't come to God in, in prayer because you, you are scared of him. If you don't, if you don't pray, he's going to destroy you, going to do something to you. But because of your relationship you have with, with him, you want to spend time with him. And the thing that I've learned in, in marriage, or trying to learn, <laughs> is, is that if you don't take time out for your husband and your wife, you wouldn't have no time at all. Because everything else is going to consume your time. So you make time for God. And it's the same way that I make time for, for, for my wife. I got to make time for the Lord. Else I will not have a relationship with him because I didn't take that time to make it for the Lord. I cannot be too busy with everything else, not, but not for God. <clears throat> um, we do not have to lift the, the receiver off the hook to talk to God. We, we do not even need to dial. We just should have our request. We, we can just talk to God while we, while we at work, while we drive down the street, we just talk to him. It's it not something that you got to make a, a phone call. I got to call on God because something going on in my life. Why do troubles always have to send me to my face in God and pray? A lot of times you could tell when, when, somebody, when somebody does not have what they need from God. That's the time you get them to pray more and more. You know, some people in the kingdom, God let them remain broke. So they, because when they are broke, they spend time with God. When they got plenty, they don't have time for God. If I'm going to spend time with God when I, when I have needs, guess what? God will always give me needs so, so I could pray. Because it, um, I could be like a, a, a person that works in the emergency room. I always taking care of emergency cases. And that's some Christian live our lives we live our life in emergency room all the time. When emergency try, don't they don't have to call us to pray. We're gonna pray. But if if there is no emergency, it's hard. We don't have time for pray. But prayer is something you gotta make time of. Philippians chapter four verse four. It says, "Rejoice in the Lord always." And I say, rejoice. in the spirit you didn't have to pray to find out the, the preacher needs some water <laughs> uh, rejoice in the lord always rejoice in the lord always always rejoice in the lord you know a lot of times rejoicing will get you a lot through a lot of trials and anything else because when you dread trials guess what you're going to spend some time in that trial let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything. Not something, in everything. Good or bad, up or down, high or low, plenty or little, in everything. By prayer supplication, with thanksgiving. Pray, you could pray and you you can make a supplication unto God, but you gotta do it with thanksgiving. You gotta be thankful for whatever state you find. You gotta be thankful. Let your request be known unto God. Sometimes you could let your request known to everybody. You know, some people you could tell when they're struggling, when they're going through things in life, because you could look at them and say, you know, that person is going through something. Let the request known. If I'm going to tell everybody about what I'm going through, why can't I tell God? Knowing the, the people I'm telling can't do nothing about it. 
because if you if you tell if you tell somebody if you tell somebody what you you are going to they they're going to do the thing that you should be doing anyhow if they are praying person they're going to pray right and you could get your prayer answered that way. But what about if the answer they gave you is not the right answer? And because you didn't get in touch with God, you never found out the right answer for your situation. With thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes, which surpasses all understanding. You know something, when you're in trouble and in trial and you have peace, the world cannot understand a Christian that have peace. You mean you're going through all this and you got peace about it? Something wrong with you. They can't, they, they, the mind can't figure that things out because most of the world want to figure everything in the mind. You know why some Christians cannot be saved? Because they're trying to figure it out. I got to figure God out. And if I cannot figure it out, guess what? You, God don't work up here. Every time you try to figure God out, he's not even going that direction you're figuring out he's going. He's doing something completely different. He changed side every time uh, I got this down pat. No, you don't. And the peace of God will pass it on and say, child, keep your heart. When that word, keep your heart, it guide. It's going to protect your heart. The world does not wanna, want us to have peace. They want us to be twiddling our thumbs and worrying about what's going to happen to me. Well, guess what? What's going to happen is going to happen. If God's going to send something your way, you could do whatever you want to. I look back on some of the things that the places I've been and things I've done. I'm like, man, you are crazy. It's only because God, because of God. I believe somebody was praying for me while I was in certain situation. I wonder, uh, you know, you look at friends and God, they end up in jail and you did not. Only because of God. Shall keep your heart and mind to Christ Jesus. John 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. Oh, time, 8.30. He that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. These things have I written unto you that, be, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that he may know. That he have eternal life and that he may believe on the name of the Son of God. <clears throat> and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hear with us, according to his will. He don't just answer any prayer because my son have prayed his prayer. Brother so and so have prayed his prayer. No, it's according to his will. When you pray in his will, he's going to answer you. But if you pray some crazy prayer, that's why some prayer people, people ask for prayer and they, they have a, um, what's the word they use? I have a, on, um, they have a request, but they don't want to tell you the request they have. But you want you, they want you to pray for them. Unspoken, that's the word, unspoken request. Some of them pray. I don't even like to pray. You got an unspoken prayer, but you want me to pray for it. How could I agree with you to pray for an unspoken prayer? Suppose you pray to commit suicide and I'm helping you pray. <laughs> if you have an unspoken prayer, you need to keep that to yourself. You pray about your unspoken prayer. You know? God don't tell you everything. So I'm got to figure out what you're praying about. No, keep that to yourself. <laughs> That's not even scripture. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> 
Oh man. <laughs> oh Lord. You see, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hear with us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. Um, Colossians chapter 4 verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Watch. A person that is not watching is not praying either. If you watch, you're going to pray because you're going to see things in the spirit that you need to pray about. Because you're watching. The devil does not want us to keep watch. He wants us to drown our flesh out with the things of this world. You know the thing about a soul here? Yeah? When they put them on watch, they watch. It doesn't matter how many hours they got to watch. It's their turn to watch. And you could trust them to watch. They was trained to watch. I got to train myself to watch, to keep a watch. Because you know what? The wolf is coming. Watch, continue in prayer and watch in the same way, thanksgiving. You do everything in thanksgiving. You don't just watch and pray, but you are thankful. You know, because I believe that a person that prays, when they reach in the point that they cannot pray no more, I believe someone prays for them. Because they've been praying. Romans chapter 12, verse 12, rejoice in hope. Patient, patient in tribulation. Patient in troubles. You are patient in troubles. When you're going through it, you're not looking for the exit sign. You are patient. You're going to stay there as long as the Lord wants you to stay in that trouble. You see, the troubles... You do not have to be a volunteer for trouble. Because the Bible says in this world you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. Be of good cheer. And the thing about it, the Bible does not say what type of trouble you're going to have. Because if you know what type of trouble you're going to face, you can prepare yourself for that certain trouble. But he does not tell you. And the Bible does not lie. If the Bible says you're going to have trouble, look out, it's going to come. You can't you can, um, can build protection around you that trouble won't hit your house. He said fall on the just and the unjust alike. That means if they hit the next door neighbor, it's going to hit you too. Everybody that was in the face of the snow, they got, they got a, a few flurries on, on their house. Because they was in that specific area. I have prayed for years, Lord, when it's winter time come, Lord, send me to a, a warm climate country. But you know something? He has not answered our prayer. Because it's not his will for me to hide when winter comes. Well. <laughs> um, 8.36. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. But when he pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. For they think that they shall hear, that they shall be heard, for they must speak in. Sometimes in prayer is not about how many words you use on that day. You could walk on the church and you could pray and you could call all these things. I, that one guy, there was a guy in church years ago. He used to pray, but he used to pray like the King James Virgin. Thou art. <laughs> I like, man, you need to go and sit down somewhere. <laughs> How would you like to be trying to pray? You're trying to see God and somebody walk around praying in King James. (laughs) 
But when he pray, use not vain repetition. Don't repeat the same thing over and over. What, what, you, what, you, what will happen if you go to your wife or your husband and you tell them the same thing over and over and over and over, over, over again? They're going to get tired. They're going to get worried. They're going to get frustrated. Why are you saying the same thing over and over and over again? What's wrong with you? You come to me with the same words over and over and you don't mean none of it. They think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Sometimes it just come in, in the, wherever you at and you just sit in there. Nobody, nobody can see your mind on the Lord. They don't know. You could be on a job sitting by the desk on your computer screen and your mind on God. But who knows? You stay in connection. You're connecting with the spirit because the flesh want to connect with flesh. You know, you know something? The, if a person walking in this room and they got a spirit of lust in them, they could tell everybody in this room that have lust on them. Because there's a connection. But when you kind of get to the spirit, you know why Peter, Paul, and those guys, when they walked down the street, things used to happen? Because they spent so many time in prayer with the spirit of the Lord. So wherever they go, the spirit of God was with them. Because they spent, the, the, the spirit absorbed them and they absorbed the spirit. So they, 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 they didn't spend time. Someday they was in the spirit and someday they was in the flesh. Because whatever you spend time with, is that's what's going to rule. If I spend time with giving myself to the flesh, that's what's going to rule my life. I don't care who, if anybody say what, or who say what, guess what? I spend time in the flesh, the flesh is going to rule me. The flesh is going to drive me. And the thing that I've learned about the flesh is never going to be satisfied. Flesh always wants more. You cannot satisfy the flesh. But when you spend time in the spirit, guess what? The spirit is going to rule. The flesh is going to get weaker and the spirit is going to get stronger because I've been giving myself to the spirit. That's why when the, when the spirit is ruling, you don't, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to um, come in here and you got to try to worship God. I'm going to try to mount up my worship or I'm going to try to pray or I'm going to try to give myself to the Lord because you've been giving yourself to the Lord. So it become, it become a place that you are used to. You ever seen people that are not used to the Spirit of God? When they come into the church and the Spirit of God moving, they get uneasy. They get unaccustomed. They, they want to walk out. They want to go to the bathroom. They want to do something. Because why? The Spirit of God made them uncomfortable. But why would I be apostolic and be uncomfortable with the Spirit of God? Whichever direction the, the Spirit of God choose to move. Because why? the thing that I've learned that when, when you are the person not, not in, in charge of the service, you will go in the direction of the person that the Lord put in charge. You will follow their direction. You don't have to sit in a the, in the, in the seat and try to pray and try to find out, God, is this the, your direction? No, I've been spending time with God. So when they sit that direction, guess what? I'm moving to that direction because I've been spending time with the Spirit of God. So things don't come like a surprise to you. When you walk down the street and you pray for somebody and they got healed, you're not shocked or surprised. Because why? I've been spending time with God. When they become a, a relationship with, with myself and the Lord, guess what? It won't be how many times that you have learned that somebody that really loves you, that cares about you, when you ask them for something, they're going to try their best to give it to you. 
Because it's a relationship. And the same thing with God. Sometimes God withholds stuff from us because why? He, if he give it to us, guess what? We wouldn't want to be bothered with him no more. So he, he keep, he keep us at the place where we want to be bothered with, with needs in our life. There's things that God want to supply for us that he cannot because I, I wouldn't build that relationship. And the relationship with God is more important than me having all the things that I need and want from God. God. Um, Jeremiah 33, 3, it said, call on me and I will answer. Call on me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I'm going to show things to you. you. You know something? That scripture with the, with the prodigal son and, and his brother, the thing that gets me the most is the, pro, the son went to the servant to find out what the father was doing. Why, why do a servant have to go to a son? If I'm the son of God, I should know what the father is doing. How many Christians that you know that, that they, they got the Holy Ghost baptized in Jesus' name, and all of a sudden they can't hear from God? If I got a spirit and he's my daddy, wouldn't the daddy tell his son, the things that he's getting ready to do, more than he will tell the servant, the one that's out in the field. But I believe the, the, the son has spent so much time in the field that he did not know how to be a son no more. God is not telling everybody what he is doing. But he's going to tell his son. Matthew 18, 18, they said, Very right, I say unto you, whatsoever he shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever, guess what? He gave us the privilege and the opportunity. So whatever I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever I loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth concerning anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst. Whatsoever I bind on earth, whatsoever you bind on earth, it shall be loose in heaven. Whatsoever you bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. So shouldn't we, we got that word that say whatever we bound and whatever we lose. Shouldn't you and I bound and lose some things in this heaven, in this earth? It's a privilege granted to us. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about you if you are caught. When I was a Catholic, I didn't have no privilege at all. I could not buy nothing. I could not lose nothing. I could not say nothing. I was, you know, I was nobody. The priest was everybody. The people in the pew was nobody, a bunch of nobodies. God didn't give me that privilege then to buy and lose. You're talking about a, a normal man. A regular man. I'm not talking about a man with a PhD. Some people think when they get their PhD and they become a doctor of the world, they can do those things. But little you and I, we can't do those things. But God has given me that privilege in his word that whatever I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever I loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So anything that comes our way, we allow it. If we don't bind it and if we don't lose nothing, nothing is going to happen. Um, Matthew 6, 6, but thou, when thou praise, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray. This, 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 this scripture verse right here, it just reminds me of, of somebody that set a time out to pray in a secret place. They find their closet. You know, I'm not talking about a normal class, but a place that you have set aside for, a, a place that you can go to and just talk to the Lord or let him talk to you either way. 
you know, a relationship. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father will see it in secret, shall reward thee openly. And that's why everybody gets jealous when somebody is being rewarded openly. What did he do to the service? You want to question God. Why didn't you question God before? But when somebody is being rewarded openly, people, jealousy starts rising up. People love you, but not when you are being blessed by God. All of a sudden, attitudes flare up. He must not have been doing something right. How, what, you know, people always want to put that check mark on what I should be doing or you should be doing to be blessed of God. Maybe God just want to bless one of his children. See it in secret shall reward thee openly. Um, Hebrew 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. When you go into the, to the throne of grace, you got to come boldly. You can't be intimidated. How, how, you know, you have a dad. And how would you, you have kids, you, you are dead. And how would you like your kids to shy away? They, they want to go to dad, but they can't go to dad because God, we, the, you, the, their father will not listen to them. So they shy away from dad. And that's what some of us do. We take God as our, our, our dad and we, we, we kind of link him up with our natural dad. How our natural dad treats us, we think our, our spiritual dad is going to treat us the same way. So we shy away from our dad. But he said, let us come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Find grace. Sometimes in my troubles, all I need is grace. Sometimes in my trial, all I need is grace. Sometimes I don't need my trial to be answered. Sometimes I don't need to get out of my situation. Sometimes all I need is the grace of God. Grace enable me to go through whatever I got to go through in this life. Hallelujah. It's not by the, but, but by the grace of God why I'm here today. How many times in my heart and in my spirit I wanted to backslide? How many times I wanted to leave the church, but because of His grace and mercy? Hallelujah. Grace is not just a license. I could do whatever I want, sin whenever I want, and come back to God. But grace gives me the strength. Grace empower me to go through whatever I got to go through, my friend. And before it ends up, I'm going to go through a whole lot more than I've been through. When you think you've been in God the longest, you think, you know, the struggle is going to subside. You won't have to go through things like you've been going through. You know something? It gets a little harder. It gets a little deeper. Some of us haven't paid the price that we're going to pray before this thing ended up. We may think, oh, Lord, I paid the greatest price I ever paid. Guess what? Hold on a while. Hallelujah. Um, James, last scripture is 851. <laughs> James chapter 5 verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. How come we don't do too much confessing to one another? Well, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know what? If I'm coming to the church and you pray for me and I pray for you and not, nothing to happen, sometimes I didn't confess. Sometimes I need to just go and confess to my brother or my sister. Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we don't do that way. We just kind of talk them out. <laughs> uh, confess your faults one to another and pray. 
one for another. Pray one for another that he may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. The effectual fervent prayer. You got to be fervent in prayer. You can't be this wishy-washy. You can't be a person that one day you want to pray for this, the other day you don't know what you want to pray for. You want to pray for this job, next time I don't want that job. Next time you want to pray for this job, you don't want that job. Next time you, you want to pray for so-and-so, next time you don't want to pray. But you are effectual fervent prayer. You are fervent in prayer. You, they can't say nothing to stop you from praying. They can't do nothing to stop you from praying. You're going to pray. You know, sometimes when a person pray, when you need someone to pray, you're going to call that person because you know that person is not going to say, brother, I'm going to pray for you. You know, how many times you look on, on one of those media, um, Facebook or one of those other ones, and you look on there and, and people sign up, they, they check their name out. I'm going to pray for you. I, I'm going to pray for you. Every prayer request, they're going to pray for that person. But how many of them really pray? I'm talking about really pray. You know, you can say, Lord, heal so and so. That's not praying, my friend. Praying is going to the depths of that person's life and holding up in prayer. You know what they, they was doing with, with, with Moses? They, they was holding up his arms. And that's what praise. Praise holding up the pastor's arms. Praise holding up the pastor's wife's arms. Because why? You, you, you know the struggle. You know the pain. You know, you know what they're going through. You're not knowing. You're not talking to them to know what's going on. But in the spirit, you know what's going on. That's why when your pastor need a prayer, you can lay his hands on him because you feel like he need a little touch. When his pastor wife need a prayer, you can pray for them because why? You're going to hold their hands up because you're fervent in prayer. You're not that wishy-washy Christian that just want to say a little word and say, you know, I pray. No, you did not. You have not seek the face of God. A person that seek the hands of God is all of them. God is doing something for them. Because why? I want his hands. And the person that want the hands of God and they seek the hands of God, when he are not blessing you, you are ready to quit. You want to give up. You want to throw in the towel. Because why? He's not giving you what you want. But when you seek in the face of God, it doesn't matter what he gave you. It doesn't matter if he give you a mansion or he give you a one bedroom shack. You're going to live with it. We're going to live in that place because why I'm seeking his face my friend because one day I want to see him face to face I don't want to just see his hands I want to see his face hallelujah hallelujah stand Jesus name let's pray Lord in the name of Jesus we thank you for this night God that's my brothers, God. That's my sisters, God. God, I pray that you bring us to a place of prayer, God. God, don't let us be prayerless, God, but let us be prayer, God. Let us seek your face, God. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, God, baptize us, God, with the spirit of prayer, God. Let the spirit of prayer come upon this church like never before, God. That each one of us, God, will seek your face, God, like we have never done before, God. Let us not reach back to the past and what we have done in the past, God, but pushing forward, God. Let us seek your face, God. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ, God. In the name of Jesus, baptize each one one of us, God, with the spirit of prayer, God. In Jesus' name, God. In the name of Jesus, God. God, you said on the upper room, God, there was in one mind and one accord in prayer, God. In Jesus' name, God. Let the Baltimore church, God, become a house of prayer, God. Let this building, God, be a house of prayer, God. In the name of Jesus, he callable shut In Jesus' name, God, let the fire burn from within this house, God, that will go forth on the outside, God. In the name of Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.